It is a real pleasure to be a moderate in this panel on the collaboration through innovative partnerships on promoting migrant integration and social cohesion. We have uh, uh, very good uh, panelists here. I would like to present them briefly to, to all of you. The first one to my right is uh, Mr. El Habib Nadir, a very good friend of us, Secretary General of the Ministry, Delegate to the Ministers of Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation in charge of Moroccans living abroad and migration affairs. Uh, Mr. El Habib uh, Nadir has been uh, there in this position since 2014, and he is currently also the co-chair for the GFMD 2017-2018. Uh, uh, at my left uh, is uh, Mr. Professor Dr. Thomas Fabian, uh, Deputy Major for Youth, Social Affairs, Health and Education of the City of Leipzig. Uh, prior to his election as Deputy Mayor in 2006, Professor Dr. Fabian was Professor of Psychology at the Department of Social Work of the Leipzig University of Applied Sciences. And from 2004 to 2006, he was a city councillor in the city of Leipzig. Uh, immediately after, it will be uh, Mr. Uh, Ola Hendrickson. Uh, Mr. Hendrickson uh, has been, uh, is the Director General of the Department of Migration and Asylum in the Swedish Ministry of Justice. Uh, he has been uh, working in this area for over 25 years, both at the national and international level. Uh, and uh, he is um, uh, a very close friend of IOM <laughs> as well, and uh, the head of the Swedish delegation at the Strategic Committee on Immigration, Frontiers and Asylum, uh, the SCAIFA. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, we have also uh, here, Mr. Douglas Sanders, uh, International Affairs Columnist for The Globe and Mail in Toronto, Canada, a writer with The Globe since 1995. He has extensive experience as a foreign correspondent. He has run The Globe's foreign uh, bureaus in Los Angeles and London, and having re uh, has reported uh, in the Middle East, North Africa, the Indian subcontinent, and East Asia. Uh, Mr. Saunders is the author of three books, Arrival City, The Myth of the Muslim Thai, and Maximum Canada with 35 million Canadian are not enough. Uh, so thanks to all of you for being here uh, at this important event. Uh, for us at IOM, uh, integration is, is really an important matter. Uh, we, uh, we were very happy that it was placed at the front and center of the Global Compact for Migration, first thematic session this year. Uh, there have been some events that have happened around, and around this subject in the past. We had uh, in IOM the International Dialogue for Migration in 2015. The city of Mechelen uh, and the government of Belgium hosted uh, a global conference on cities and migration uh, on last uh, 16 and 17 of November. And uh, with, with us, uh, a new inhabitant. Uh, but uh, uh, integration for us is, is real essential, an essential component of uh, comprehensive, well-functioning migration management that prevents the marginalization of newcomers and contributes to stable and inclusive societies. Integration usually uh, implies also the respect of a set of rights and responsibilities, as well as the respect of a series of core values. Um, we promote in IOM a comprehensive approach to integration because we believe that they are necessary to create an enabled environment in which migrants can develop their full potential and become real actors, uh, active members of, of the society. We're going to be looking at, during this panel, uh, at the question on the important role of the cities in the integration process. What can uh, be the advantage or the focal point of local authorities uh, compared with the national governments in this area? 
uh, we, we believe strongly that local authorities, including mayors, have a very important role in promoting diversity, both at the, at the workplace as well as uh, within the community. We are also wanting to see a little bit what the role of the private sector uh, is uh, in this. Um, we, we strongly believe, and, and as the Director General said before, I had been leading uh, a process of uh, strategic development in, in IOM about the private sector, uh, and we, we know that it is extremely important to engage uh, in these type of partnerships uh, and how much these partnerships between governments and media actors uh, are, are uh, helpful for, for everybody. Uh, they, I think the private sector has realized also that they have an increasing uh, important role to play in the implementation of integration policies uh, and they have been actively engaging lately into that. Uh, finally, I think the, the last point that I would like to make is that integration is always more difficult uh, when uh, there is this prevailing anti-migrant sentiment uh, that you know, counters uh, the narrative uh, uh, of uh, the positive element of migration and focuses on discrimination, xenophobia, etc., that very often permeates uh, the media. So, with these opening remarks, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Nadir uh, for his uh, participation. Thanks. Vous avez la parole. You have the floor. Thank you very much indeed, uh, moderator. Dear friend, I'd also like to thank the whole of uh, the IOM uh, team for having uh, invited Morocco to share its uh, experience with regard to the integration of migrants and our major achievements in uh, immigration policy. We have uh, adopted a policy uh, about four years ago. We were uh, traditionally a, a country of origin, but uh, over the past few years, we have become a country of destination for many migrants. I'd just like to remind you uh, of uh, two guiding principles of our migration policy in Morocco. A royal uh, humanist uh, vision based on the principle of solidarity with our uh, uh, fellow African countries, because most of the um, immigrants in Morocco are from sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as well as a few Syrians. The second guiding principle of uh, the development of our immigration policy was the constitution that was uh, recently adopted in 2011, and which enshrines the principle of a pluralistic society in Morocco. That principle adopted in the Constitution declares uh, Morocco's commitment to protect its diversity as well as its national identity based on the convergence of uh, uh, Arabo-Islamic uh, Hassani and Azawir origins as well as its uh, Andalus, Hebraic, Mediterranean and African origins. What that means is that uh, Morocco has enshrined in its constitution the principle of uh, multiculturalism, uh, cultural diversity. As we know, migration is a cross-cutting and very complex issue. And uh, to effectively manage uh, migration, you need uh, varied and innovative responses. And that uh, is what this uh, panel is designed to address. Let's focus on what we have done, specific initiatives that we have taken over recent years, as well as some weaknesses to those policies. Firstly, um, among our government agencies, we have set up an interministerial committee chaired by the head of uh, government, where all sectors and government agencies are, are, are represented. Um, at least all of those are uh, concerned by migration-related issues, and uh, they meet at least twice a, twice a year in order to take, take stock uh, and uh, provide necessary guidance to improve our programs. The main objective is to integrate uh, migration in, 
issues into all uh, sectoral initiatives and programs. We have made uh, some progress recently, but we need to integrate migration in issues into education, health and agriculture programs. Otherwise, uh, m the individual respective ministries uh, won't be in a position to deal with this effectively. We also have a national steering committee for implementing the national strategy, which meets uh, four times a year in order to take stock of uh, different sectoral programs relating to education, health, and so on. The second main partner for us uh, is civil society. We have uh, partnership agreements in place with uh, about 130 civil society organizations. These are migrant associations, for instance. We have encouraged migrants to uh, form associations, and there are about 30 of those in Morocco. All of this is fairly recent. The uh, Moroccan law for the creation of association didn't initially allow that, and uh, we have now advocated and ensured that migrants can form associations, and we have about 30 of those, three or four of which are associations of migrant women. We also have uh, a trade union, which is one of the main five uh, unions in Morocco, that has set up uh, a, a specific uh, union for migrants to help them integrate more effectively. in uh, all areas of society. We've launched two operations for regularizing migrants, one in 2014 and one which uh, will be completed at the end of this year. And we've involved migrants in appeal committees at the local level and indeed the national appeal committee. So they are very much involved, they participate effectively at the administrative level. Just to give you some idea of that uh, and uh, the initiatives that we've taken to promote uh, migrant integration. We have those two regularization campaigns. We decided uh, to regularize all women and children, even if they didn't meet the specific criteria set out for regular migratory status. In schools, we've opened up our schools to all migrant uh, children, irrespective of the migratory status of their parents. We don't require parents to be regular migrants um, before admitting their children into schools. And that was a measure that we took even before we started talking about uh, our new migration policy. With regard to health, migrants are entitled to access to uh, a healthcare system, which is usually reserved for the most uh, the poorest Moroccans, so they have that beneficial uh, access um, along the same conditions as for Moroccans. In employment, we've uh, removed the national preference provision, which was a terrible problem for migrants in our country. We copied that from uh, our French friends, but that's a provision that's been removed now, so any migrant uh, can now um, work uh, freely in Morocco. We've also taken steps in regard to vocational training um, and uh, income generating activity. As you know, Morocco is not a very industrially developed country and all of our uh, in, uh, income generating activities, creating of cooperatives, for example, uh, are managed by a specific framework. And there we've allowed migrants as well to set up uh, cooperatives in this way by amending the law. Cooperation with civil society, as I've mentioned, there are 130 different associations working on uh, educational projects, for example, with regard to learning Arabic, that's a key to social cohesion. You need to help people speak uh, the same language as their Moroccan neighbors. There is formal education for children who have not been through that process, educational support. Very often they have specific linguistic challenges, these children, um, because of their origin. And we have uh, legal assistance programs as well, um, care for children during the, the, during the school holidays. I won't go into all of the details there. One of the weaknesses that we are working on now is involving local actors 
Uh, everything happens through uh, local elected officials and um, uh, authorities. And thanks to the support from uh, German agencies, uh, for, exam for example, we have 10 different uh, towns in three different regions where there is a high level of Im immigration. There are pro projects to help local authorities to integrate migration into local development plans in their various communes. Another form of partnership that we have developed. Since we're talking about innovative uh, partnerships, uh, we have 20 university experts who are now involved in all of our thought process with regard to migration phenomena. So those university experts uh, of working on masters, programs, doctorates uh, in their relevant uh, faculties uh, focusing on migration issues. And I'll finish by uh, quoting from the GFMD, which we are co-directing uh, with our German friends in 2018. Uh, the three key themes uh, include one on vulnerability, how to move from migrant vulnerability to migrant resilience in order to free up the potential of migrants as uh, um, tools for development in their countries of origin and uh, countries of destination. That's one of the themes that we'll be dealing with in 2018. We've also organized a thematic workshop on cultural diversity and migration in order to try to exchange uh, experiences and learn from each other to help ensure um, social cohesion. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I'm not going to on any of them because we have 30 more minutes and we have three other speakers. So, yeah, if uh, the Mr. Deputy Mayor, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Okay. Do I see my presentation? Yes. Where? Is it up here? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, I couldn't see my own presentation, which I have prepared um, uh, for you. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, about um, uh, our experiences and uh, our concept uh, of integration of migrants in the city of Leipzig in Germany. To start off with, um, Leipzig has undergone some major changes in the past uh, quarter of a century. Um, you may know that um, in 1989 there was a peaceful revolution um, in uh, Germany and uh, Leipzig played a major role uh, in the change, uh, in the political change, which meant in the beginning that um, a lot of uh, inhabitants of Leipzig left the city, to, especially to West Germany, so w there was a big decline of population uh, within Leipzig, and um, but uh, we have been able to make the turnaround. So Leipzig is now a, gr a fast-growing city. Um, the birth rate has increased a lot, um, and we have many people moving into Leipzig and also migrants. At the beginning, um, uh, in the early 90s, there were very few migrants living in Leipzig, like other parts of East Germany. But now uh, the situation has uh, changed, and and um, we are uh, getting many people from um, abroad um, uh, uh, which um, live in our city. Maybe contrary to um, other uh, cities um, in Europe, um, the migrants don't live at the margins of our city, but they live very closely to the city center. Like you can see on this uh, slide, um, the darker the red is, the more, uh, the higher the percentage of migrants living in these uh, neighborhoods is. Um, 
In 2015 and 2016, uh, we had a rapidly increasing number of refugees coming to Germany. And uh, within Germany, we have a, dis uh, a system of distribution um, uh, uh, between the uh, federal states um, according to the number of the population and the strength um, of taxes. Uh, and within each uh, country, we again have a distribution to the local um, uh, areas um, according to the number of um, population. This, I think, is a very um, fair system of distribution of refugees uh, within in Germany. Um, you, as you can see on the slide, um, in the year 2015, we had um, almost 5,000 refugees coming uh, to Germany. Um, among them, uh, almost um, more than 500 uh, uh, unaccompanied minors. So what did we do? We had to um, uh, take immediate action. <laughs> And uh, one of the most important things was that um, we, um, uh, from the town hall, uh, the mayor and his deputy mayors um, uh, took political leadership because, um, uh, like in many other places, also in Leipzig, there were also critical and to some extent also xenophobic um, attitudes on the one side. However, on the other hand, we had um, a, a, um, an overwhelming um, a part of the population that was welcoming the refugees and was uh, prepared to help wherever they could. But um, uh, I think one of the big, uh, most important things to have successful integration uh, with um, in integrating a sudden big number of refugees in our city was that um, uh, we um, had uh, continuous communication and also transparent communication in all neighborhoods where we um, were having um, uh, residential places for refugees where they arrived. Uh, our policy is that they move as soon as possible into their own apartments, but in the beginning they live in residential places. Um, we, had, um, uh, we had to um, uh, develop our collaboration within uh, the local administration, um, like in every other city, there are different departments and they all have their specific task, but um, we could only be successful with providing housing uh, for the refugees if all departments work together. Therefore, we set up um, a high-level task force led by the mayor and his deputy mayors and all uh, heads of the departments. Um, uh, so we were able to um, accelerate all decision-making processes. We have, um, uh, for, the, um, for the past 10 years, um, a developed concept and strategy for uh, integration because um, uh, we didn't want to repeat mistakes that were done in the 1960s and 70s in West German cities. Um, and because uh, the number of migrants in the 19th, uh, 90s were still very small, we had the chance um, to um, develop new concepts and um, regard the migrants as part of our population and try to integrate them as soon as possible. Of course, we needed political guidelines um, that were um, uh, decided uh, by our local um, uh, city council and a very differentiated um, concept for integration covering uh, all areas. Regarding the houses of refugees, um, uh, uh, we, were, uh, we had a concept that we wanted uh, to distribute these residential places all over the city, which means uh, that not in one specific area um, uh, uh, we had uh, all the ho homes uh, for the refugees, but uh, to uh, they uh, should be spread all over the city. And as you can see on this slide, um, we managed to have these uh, places all over the city. Why was this so important? Of course, um, a city like Leipzig undergoes um, social segregation like all big cities, but we didn't want to have um, uh, on top of the social segregation um, uh, uh, the problem uh, with refugees in poor people's areas. Of course, in the beginning, it was easier to find empty houses in poor people's areas. So 
I had big difficulties arguing with the neighborhoods that we uh, wanted to have uh, residential places for, re for refugees. But as soon as I was able to tell them that in other neighborhoods where the upper middle class uh, people lived, we were also able um, uh, to um, have residential places for refugees, the situation calmed down a lot. Also, I must say that even in those areas where in the beginning um, the people had concerns about having their new neighbors uh, um, being uh, refugees, once the refugees moved into the houses, we had no, uh, hardly any problems at all. Um, uh, being a psychologist, um, I usually say, told my students before I became a mayor, uh, fantasy um, is wild uh, and reality is diverse. Uh, so um, uh, as soon as um, the refugees moved into the houses, we even had support by the neighborhood in those areas where at the beginning there were uh, negative attitudes towards them. One of the crucial keys um, uh, to being able to have a good integration of the refugees is the, is the social work that we provide in every single um, uh, residential place for social workers. They have three tasks. First of all, they support um, and give counseling to the refugees. Secondly, they are the persons for the immediate neighborhood to turn to if there are problems or if they want to um, uh, provide help and they also build networks within the commun local community. Um, one of the key um, uh, elements for uh, a successful integration is in Germany learning the lang uh, German language and we say um, we want to start from day first um, uh, with um, uh, integration and providing German classes uh, for the refugees. And also one of the uh, important things is uh, that uh, the children um, get places in kindergartens as soon as possible um, and um, they are integrated into schools. Um, in Germany, everyone has to go to school. Also the refugees have to go to school and also the refugees' children have a right to get a place in a kindergarten. Um, then uh, to have, I would say, more or less complete um, integration, it is necessary for um, uh, the uh, refugees uh, to find um, employment. Um, and we work very uh, closely together with the national agencies. Um, and we have several programs, um, also specific programs, um, specific programs for young people, uh, programs uh, for women uh, to be integrated into the labor market. However, I have to admit this is one of the uh, most difficult tasks because um, first of all they have to learn German, secondly we have a lot of young people um, because um, of different reasons. They have um, uh, not been to school for a long time, um, uh, then many professions the refugees um, have um, uh, learned in their home countries um, usually don't really fulfill the qualification qu requirements in Germany. So this is one of the um, most challenging tasks, um, uh, but it is necessar necessary for full integration and also for them to be able to learn uh, to earn their own living. The area of culture is um, uh, um, uh, a very, also a very important one. One example, we had a theater play which was done by the local actors together with refugees um, and, and, um, uh, and having a play about the experience of the refugees and their uh, um, integration in Germany. Sports is um, usually also a very good area for integration because usually when you play football you don't need um, to know German. Um, they understand themselves by body language. And um, yeah, we have many different areas which are important um, uh, to deal with, uh, to um, uh, help with integration, and we have very many different players. We cooperate um, with different administrations, um, but uh, also with um, uh, the local economy, um, with welfare organizations, and of course with the civil society, and uh, we had a lot of support from the civil society. Our task, this is our, always our main message, is is that uh, we have to help refugees to settle in well in our city. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And let me now give the floor to Ola Henriksson from Swedish. Thank you, Deputy Director General, and thank you for letting me speak on this important topic. Sweden has a long-standing tradition of welcoming migrants. Migration does not only contribute to development through the hundreds of millions of dollars remitted each year. Migration also contributes through filling needs in the labor market, encouraging trade and investments between countries, as well as transferring skills and ideas as transnational networks are formed. One example of the many positive contributions of migrants in this is the Swedish ICT sector, which each year employs thousands of IT specialists from all over the world. Their employment in Sweden is often essential to the success of Swedish companies, but it also empowers people from developing countries by increasing their know-how and, finan and financial situation, and thus, in the long run, also the development in their home countries. For, migra for migrants who come to Sweden specifically to work, the Swedish labor migration system provides an avenue to go from temporary to permanent migration, once firmly established on the labor market. Spouses of migrants workers coming to Sweden are entitled to work. This employment policy is good for gender equality and it's good for integration and it also raises tax revenues. Looking more broadly, Sweden, workers in Sweden enjoy the same labor rights regardless of the country of origin. This means, for example, that migrant workers have equal access to parental leave and child care that they have access to the same level of health care, including sexual and reprodu reproductive health rights. Such rights are crucial for decent work in general and for gender equality in particular. In 2015, we experienced the largest per capita inflow of asylum seeker ever recorded in an OECD country. This has caused strains on our reception system and will have a long-term impact in various sectors of the Swedish society. What we now experience is when welcoming so many newly arrived immigrants to Sweden in such a short period is also an opportunity. Let me share some of our, our experiences with integrations of newly arrived immigrants in Sweden's society. Around 70% of the newly arrived migrants currently in Sweden are between 20 and 39 years old. This means that the number of persons in Sweden who have valuable experiences, connections and language skills from other countries of the world are increasing. About one third are well educated, uh, uh, but some have basic education and some lack sufficient skill for the Swedish labor market. We need to provide sufficient tools and opportunities for people to fulfill their potential and contribute to society. In order to lower the thresholds for newly arrived migrants to enter into the labor market, we have introduced a number of targeted measures, such as subsidized jobs, complementary education programs, and validation of work placement. For newly arrived immigrants, Sweden has a fast track system for sectors with skill shortages. Through this system, newly arrived can have their skills validated, be offered complementary education, and training where this is required and offers internships to gain foothold on the labor market. The fast track system relies on a public-private partnership whereby branch associations provide guidance on competencies required for their respective fields of work. A recent OECD study called My Making Integration Work highlights this fast track system among a number of important lessons in the assessment and recognition of foreign qual qualifications. Still, there are more work to be done. Employment rates is still significantly lower among persons born abroad than among persons born in Sweden, especially among women. This remains a particular area of concern for the government, especially when it comes to women born outside Europe with low education and limited working experiences. Achieving better results and providing more targeted and efficient measures for these women is crucial. This is why it is important to incorporate gender-sensitive perspective in legislation, policies, and programs. The Swedish government is a feminist government. This calls for ensuring that migrant women and men are empowered as well as their rights are fully protected through a regulatory framework. Research suggests that female-dominant occupations suffer from more stressful work environment and that women are overrepresented in work related to diseases. Accordingly, a gender perspective is needed to address these challenges. Our goal must naturally be to have our new citizens, women and men, will be active and influential in developing and empowering our society. 
we are convinced that this is good for the migrants that join our societies. It is good for the Swedish public finances as it raises tax revenues, and it's good for public perception and social cohesion as people feel included and that refugees and migrants are contributing to our societies. It is also in this spirit of leaving no one behind that we must continue to strive towards the goal of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and for which we should find inspiration as we continue to engage in the Global Compact on Migration. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to conclude, uh, Mr. Saunders, uh, you have the floor. We've just heard from uh, one representative from the Global South and two from uh, cities and national governments of, uh, of Europe. And uh, I, I think what's interesting is what's in common between the approaches to integration they discussed, which is uh, quick access to the educational system, access to the labor force, and fairly rapid pathways to citizenship and full inclusion. I think these, these are common factors that we're starting to understand across the countries and the cities that are successful in bringing people from being newcomers to being full uh, and equal participants and citizens in the countries they're in. The, my area of, of research and specialty during the last 15 years has been the places, the neighborhoods in cities where immigrants first settle and what makes some of these places turn into places of great uh, intergenerational social and economic mobility and the places where a new middle class is born? What makes some of these places spiral into intergenerational poverty and into uh, exclusion and sometimes violence and extremism? And what are the best interventions to turn those spirals of decline in, into uh, spirals of success again. And I think if there's uh, one common feature in the places that have been able to turn the migration experience into one of, uh, one of, so of mobility and inclusion, it's that they, these places tend to view integration not as something that is done to immigrants by governments, not as, not as, not as something that you have an immigration department or ministry that imposes integration onto people, but rather as a matter of self-integration by migrants and immigrants themselves and the government's role of, and the city's role as being one of removing the obstacles to self-integration that are often built into these, these urban districts where people first settle. And this is equally true for the international migration experience as it is for the internal rural to urban migration experience. The urban districts created by these migration experiences often have similar features, similar opportunities and resources for the new migrants to include themselves in the economy and the political and educational and cultural system of the city. They also usually feature very similar obstacles uh, to that inclusion. So my, my unit of analysis is, is, the, is the, the place we tend to call the arrival city. Um, which is which is the city within the city, you could say, that, uh, that do we have that slide up? No, yes, we do. The city within the city created by networks of migrants themselves, uh, uh, sometimes in the form of, of a specific urban district where people cluster by place of origin, where they loan each other money, where they provide each other with housing, they provide each other with assistance in integration, sometimes more of a virtual place uh, where migrants scattered across a city link each other up uh, through institutions, uh, through connections, often through electronic media nowadays to, again, assist one another with, uh, with inclusion and integration, to getting past the barriers of economic marginality sometimes of racial and cultural exclusion, uh, of the usual barriers of beginning on the, the bottom floor. And one of the, one of the factors I find in all cities, regardless of their income level, regardless of their, of their geographic position, is that the, the urban places where people first settle 
are ideally suited to be the bottom rung on the ladder of integration, usually because the housing is at a much lower cost, uh, whatever the form of tenure, than elsewhere in the city. But this, whatever the factor is that makes a place a good bottom rung on the ladder, often removes the second and third rungs on the ladder. What made the housing cheaper than elsewhere? Usually whatever it was, whether it's a terribly long commuting distance from the main city, or it's a bad reputation or history of racial or cultural exclusion, or poor quality of housing, poor quality of schools, whatever made th that neighborhood a good bottom rung because the housing's cheaper will often create spirals of failure in subsequent generations. Um, and it's worth cities looking at what it is that made a place a good starting point, what it is that's missing on the next rungs, and we'll take a look at some of those, some of those factors in, in a moment. Now, we have to acknowledge that cities contain many forms of migrants in them. Um, this is a useful here template here. This is a, uh, I, I, I owe this graph to the World Health Organization uh, of the types of migrants who tend to find themselves in cities and tend to be intermixed in complex mixtures, ranging from uh, formal uh, economic migrants, either internationally or internally, to irregular migrants who, who are not recognized by the city as being legitimate residents, to various forms of refugees and trafficked people and asylum seekers. And I think the important lesson from places that have managed to do integration right is that we need to create quick pathways for people of these different categories to become members of different categories. For most importantly, for refugees very quickly to be turned into regular economic migrants who immediately have access to the labor force, ideally before they've learned the language, and then for those economic migrants very quickly to be, to, to be able to be turned into citizens or long-term permanent residents uh, of the place. Um, for when there are large pathways of irregular and illegal uh, migration, for those to be reduced by the creation of legal pathways of regular migration that allows, the, allows those populations to, to migrate back and forth in a temporary and legal way rather than a permanent and irregular way and so on. So often, often a recognition that, that the people settling in your city are, are coming in various ways and the creation of pathways between those methods. Um, and an understanding that the urban districts where people settle are often um, are places that are subject to forces that push them in different directions. As I, as I mentioned, there are, there are things built into the resources of these urban neighborhoods that can cause a downward spiral uh, of failure, an upward spiral of success. Uh, this is the World Economic Forum's way of examining this set of pressures on these, on these urban districts uh, as influences on negative and, and positive development. Let me, let me show you uh, how we developed this. I was engaged in a research project over the last couple years with the, the World Bank to look at barriers to inclusion uh, of labor migrants in western cities, uh, but this is also, this grid is also applicable to uh, cities of the global south and, uh, and less developed countries. This is a very simplified version of what we're looking at. Basically, we looked at the resources used in every city that we could examine that are used by immigrants and migrants to include themselves, to become included in the economy, to become integrated into the, into the social and political and educational systems. And we flipped that around and said, what, 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 are, what causes people to fail to be integrated? It's usually the lack of one of these important resources. So we, we looked at the categories. Very often these are physical resources caused by the design and shape of the places where people first settle in cities. Uh, housing is, is often the first thing people seek. People will seek to live in places where they can afford to live, but migrants will often choose to live in somewhere where they cannot afford to live. If there are, econo if there are economic opportunities, small business opportunities, or there are 
networks of people from similar linguistic and cultural backgrounds to help them integrate. And we need to recognize that, that, uh, that often the lowest cost housing is not the ideal for place for people to settle because whatever caused the housing to be lowest cost means there's no economy there and so on. And the physical barriers to integration often involve transportation. Uh, a, a, a migrant district that has a two hour bus ride to the best jobs in town uh, and a two hour bus ride back creates barriers to integration because the people who are taking those commutes are isolated from their families. No surprise if their children use the empty spaces between the housing buildings as their only form of childcare, they join a gang or something like that. The ability to have long-term tenure on your housing is important. Uh, I found the cities both in uh, less developed countries and in the West where immigrants are able to integrate most effectively are ones where there's a pathway to full to long-term tenure or ownership of the housing even at low income value often the barriers are institutional the lack of good schools the lack of good institutions i found that the often what what can reverse a downward spiral of failed integration is to invest in the schools in immigrant districts not simply to bring them up to the average level of uh of of the city around them, but to put a school in the immigrant districts that is much, much better than any of the other schools in the city so that those districts, rather than being a place people try to escape, become a place that, that students from middle class districts compete to get into and include themselves. Um, and economic barriers are often, often the most significant barriers to inclusion. We need to stop thinking of immigrants, whether internal or international, as being units of labor uh, who are either filling labor shortages or competing with the domestic labor force. We have to understand that migrants are more often today creators of employment. They are people who form businesses and create economic opportunities to employ people if, we're, if we allow them to, if we allow them to do so before they've learned the language, if we allow them to do so uh, with each other after they've settled, if we can remove barriers to the creation of legal small businesses and, uh, and shops and so on, that, that creates the instruments of self-integration. Self and finally, there are political barriers to integration built into many cities. Sometimes these are simple matters of racial or cultural intolerance of the backgrounds of the people who are settling that need to be, that need to be dealt with. Often they are a lack of access to citizenship, by which I mean not just full legal citizenship, but the resources of de facto citizenship, the ability to be included in the institutions of the city, to be represented in the governing bodies of the city, to be seen by the city as being full members of, of the urban community. And in summary, I would say we need, cities and national governments need to look at these obstacles to self-integration because by removing these barriers early, by making a small investment to remove these sets of barriers so that people can engage in the process of self-integration, it can save a lot of cost and a lot of political and social difficulty down the road that will be more expensive if it's allowed to spiral into generations of failed integration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, very briefly to summarize, uh, very good for pre presentations of different perspectives, but a lot of commonalities, as the last speaker said, uh, language learning, child, children integration, labor market, and how difficult it is to bring people, validation of skills and foreign qualifications is one of the things that and I, th I like very much the the end of the of your presentation, uh, Mr. Sanders, uh, about the physical, institutional, economic, and political political obstacles that I think basically put all of the uh, comments that were made uh, before. Uh, we have literally uh, five more minutes uh, in order to to finish this, and I'm really sorry about about this, but we started a little bit late. The panel. Uh, is there any burning question that uh, you, Mr. Uh, Delegate from Yemen and Sierra Leone, I think I will give you the floor to both of you. Uh, really short comments, please, or questions to the panelists. Uh, thank you. Uh, Yemen, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Madam Moderator, and I wish to thank the entire panelists for their informative uh, presentation. Uh, Madam Moderator, I just uh, wish to talk about the building capacities of the migrants, which is so important to help for the sustainable and uh, dignified integration uh, of the migrants. Uh, in this regard, uh, I just wish to emphasize uh, the importance uh, of the uh, multi-stakeholders approach uh, where the social uh, initiatives needs to be promoted and uh, supported. I thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, Ambassador Stevens, you have mm. the floor. Yes, thank you very much. I have two quick questions. I just wanted the panelists to comment a bit on their policy and their experiences in terms of family reunification and also to mention the International Convention on um, Migrant, Human Rights of Migrant Workers and Their Families. And it is, I think of the panelists there, Morocco is one that has ratified, but the other countries have not. So just to, for them to comment on it, why is it, um, because it's only looking for the human rights of migrant workers, no, no any additional rights, but in only 49 countries have ratified or acceded to that convention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. You have the floor. Um, mine goes to the Deputy Mayor from Leipzig. Lip Lip um, I want to know what they are doing, how he reconciles it with um, their national policy of trying to um, encourage more migrants to go back home and also making sure that at least um, they are from their countries of origin, um, they become happy there and they do not even come to Europe, especially to Germany. Thank you very much. Ambassador of Gavon, you have the floor. Je vous remercie, Madame la Thank you, Madam Moderator. The time is so brief that I'm just going to make a few comments. First, to congratulate the panelists on their brilliant presentations, and then particularly talking to Mr. Nadir from Morocco, Gabon, would like to particularly express its pleasure at all the measures taken by the Kingdom of Morocco and the, uh, the pro-African policy of the King Mohammed VI. We'd like to particularly emphasize the geographic position uh, of Morocco, which has a very close uh, border with Spain. And we'd like to say that Moroccan policy is welcome in the sense that at present we know what's going on in the world today, and it brings us back that at other times in the past, and we just congratulate Morocco for all their efforts, also with the, um, the relations of Morocco with Germany through the GFMD. Thank you very much. Uh, I realize the time. I just uh, couldn't uh, avoid taking the floor just to acknowledge uh, the excellent p presentations of the panelists today. As in, uh, Mr. Saunders, good to see you uh, here as well. Uh, uh, just in light of the time, and especially considering uh, where we are in the pr in the course of the uh, the path to the global compact. Uh, as Canada, uh, as you, you may all know, the, 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 uh, we do uh, promote a whole of a society approach when it comes to integration and many of the aspects uh, in the presentation today reflect that. I'd like to, in terms of, if we're thinking of the commitments that states uh, here will want to make uh, in the Global Compact, uh, I'd like to ask the panelists to, if they can share their views in terms of not only uh, uh, trying to implement this kind of whole society approach and the commitments that states can be putting forward in the compact, but also in terms of the uh, roles and responsibilities of political leadership in terms of influencing uh, public attitudes uh, and, and opinions uh, in, in, the, in society that influence uh, the attitudes and facilitate integration of, uh, uh, of nuclear, which are so critical in terms of uh, f facilitating the efficiencies of uh, those efforts that states uh, may be uh, trying to put in place in collaboration with civil society and the private sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will give uh, each one of you 30 seconds to, to respond, and I, I will start with uh, Mr. Saunders. If you have any comments to make. I, I, I'll let uh, Mr. Fabian. Uh, Mr. Fabian. Because Dr. He has, uh, Okay, there was uh, one question directly addressed um, by Ghana to uh, me uh, as a deputy mayor of the city of Leipzig. Um, 
On the local level, we try to do everything to um, have a successful integration uh, of uh, refugees and migrants that come to our city. And um, uh, we also try uh, to um, help what um, uh, Mr. Saunders described as uh, self-integration. Uh, this corresponds with one of the basic uh, principles of social work, helping people to helping themselves, especially in the beginning. Um, what we also provide is um, uh, counseling, social counseling for people who do want to return voluntarily uh, because um, a lot of refugees that come to our city um, do not want to stay forever in Leipzig. Some want to stay for a long time, but there's also uh, quite a lot of people who would like to return if the situation in their country uh, has changed. And um, there is, um, I always say, no population as diverse as refugees coming to our city. Yeah, they come from loads and loads of different countries, lots of lots of different personal uh, backgrounds. Uh, so the situation is different for different kinds of people. What we provide is counseling for people who want to return. Uh, but uh, forcing people to return is not on the local level. This is uh, national policy. Then the question um, by Sierra Leone, family reunification. This is, as you probably all know, is a big political topic at the moment in Germany. Um, uh, um, from the local level, um, I personally believe that uh, family reunification helps integration uh, because we also observe that um, children are the ones who are able to self-integrate themselves the quickest. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harrington. Uh, thank you. Yes, on family unification, uh, let, let me start by saying that we, we promote safe, orderly and regular migration and we, we, and we are migration-friendly country, but, but it needs to be in, under those circumstances. We have quite large number of family unifications. There are some temporary limitations right now, but we still have quite big numbers of family unification uh, people coming to, to Sweden. On the Migrant Workers Convention, no, we have not ratified the convention, as, as you know. And I don't see that we will do it in, uh, either in, in the near future, at least. I think the rights that are enshrined in that convention, we looked at it quite carefully, are already implemented in national legislation and it's also enshrined in other parts of, of uh, international law that we have ratified. So I think that there's no loss of rights due to, to the fact that we haven't ratified the convention. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sanders. Thank you. With, with regard to family reunification, and this speaks to the sort of whole whole society inter interinstitutional approach to integration. Um, I think many governments, particularly of uh, developed countries, have a, a fear of family reunification based on based on the idea that having a lot of migrants settled in one place who are t closely connected together and who who who, who speak the same foreign language and come from a foreign culture, that they are going to cluster together and form uh, a parallel society or a uh, segregated place or a ghetto or something like that. Um, but we know from the experiences of places that have, have had very successful integration, that have had waves of people coming from many different backgrounds and languages and religions quickly within a within a couple generations becoming very well included parts of the society that actually what makes integration work best is also this form of uh, of self-selected uh, mutual assistance the formation of networks and that sort of thing and that one of the things that can be the most difficult barriers to integration is not allowing families to unify turning people into isolated units of labor uh, stuck as the only person who's a member of their background in a neighborhood can, can, be, can be one of the biggest barriers to integration. So we need to deal with what are the actual root problems of failed integration and uh, family, allowing full family reunification as quickly as possible is, is an important tool to integration, not, not to its opposite. Thank you very much. Uh, conclure, Monsieur le to conclude, Mr. Secretary General, thank you. I'd just like to thank all the delegates who've encouraged Morocco in its migration policy. Morocco ratified the Convention on Rights of Migrant Workers and their family members. And on the question of the role of cities with our German friends, 
we have in our GFMD 2018 uh, agenda to organize a workshop on migration and the role of cities to try to share good practices in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all. Thank you very much to the panelists. And, and thank you uh, particularly to the interpreters that have accepted to remain a little bit longer in order to be able to respond to these questions. Uh, this meeting is adjourned, and we will see each other at 3 o'clock. <laughs>